PG-13 rating. That means uh, leave the little kitties at home. I think you're going to like Batman. I'm Arch Campbell, and I hope you see something good at the movies. Looks really good. Oh, oh boy. Make lots of money. Now, yeah. on Batcast. For the As Amanda Nissen tells us tonight, both Miss Faulkner and the Citadel are claiming victory tonight. I fully expect to be implemented totally into the Citadel system. What about shaving your head? If I have to shave my head, I will shave my head. Shannon Faulkner fully expects to be the first... Court of Appeals decides the Citadel's all-male admission policy violates her right. She and her attorney think that means that she's in. The court says that she must be admitted to the junior class in August unless an alternative program is set up for women who want a military education. The Citadel says they have that plan to set up a separate school, maybe in Columbia. Now that could keep Shannon out. You don't think this is going to put Shannon Faulkner in the Citadel in August? No, uh, that's, the, the court was... was uh, pretty direct in saying that if the state follows through with its plan to do a parallel program that Shannon Faulkner will not be admitted. What happens if in August the Citadel does have another school in place for women? Well, first of all, it's a big if, but uh, the immediate answer is that Faulkner has always said she only wants the Citadel. Shannon Faulkner says this is a victory for her. The Citadel says not so fast. This is a victory for us. One side has got to give, but for now, it looks like that in August, Shannon Faulkner will walk through these gates, the first female to the Citadel's Corps of Cadets. Amanda Nissen, Live 5 News, Nightwatch. So what do you think about Shannon breaking that all-male tradition? Tonight we took to the streets to find out what some of you think. That, um, I really think that the Citadel should have allowed her to be admitted initially. She probably wouldn't have lasted 30 days that she'd have been gone anyway, and we would have saved ourselves all this trouble. See, people always talk about tradition, this and tradition, that, but if uh, you always went by tradition, People like me wouldn't be able to go to college. I also feel like the integrity of the core might possibly go down. From, I guess, the military standpoint, that she should have just left it alone. I guess I'm old-fashioned, but when I think of military, I think of men. Your reaction tonight. Welcome back. If you just joined in Single Parent Corner, you missed a great segment about the Martin Luther King celebration. And as you know, we are talking about self-evaluation this month. Um, for this year. And I'd like to introduce to you, I'm, I'm honored to have him in the studio as well, a professor from the College of Charleston. His name is Mr. Damon Fordham. How are you, Mr. Carpenter? Fine. How are you doing, Mr. Fordham? Wonderful, ma'am. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining the Single Parent Corner. Now, we want to talk about, as I said, our theme is self-evaluation. But before we get to that, I'd like for you to tell the audience what you teach okay. at the university. All right. I teach uh, U.S. history and African-American studies, but I also make it a point to do a lot of outside speaking so the people who aren't in the colleges will get this information also. Okay. Um, now, that's wonderful, and that's why you're coming on Single Parent Corner, because, as I said, the theme for this month is self-evaluation. Single Parent Corner, we feel that this year we want everybody to take an assessment of themselves. So since you teach history, what I wanted to find out from you is if you could give us some aspects about history as it relates to oneself, you know, the attitudes that we have about oneself and where that might have played a role in history. Well, it plays a major role in history because what you had was whenever you have an oppressed group, particularly uh, women, African Americans, or even the poor whites as a matter of fact, the, lo the dominant society would often teach these people that they were less than what they actually were. Mm -hmm. Deliberately indoctrinate them, teach them that they, were, that they were less than what God intended them to be. And that way, once they were taught that, they would serve a subservient role in society or be used as cheap labor. As I said, the same is true with women in general, the same is true with African Americans, the same is true with poor whites especially okay. in the southern United States. Oh, okay. As far, the way history is, we were talking about this earlier, mm -hmm. as far as self-esteem as being one of those major issues. How did that play a role in history? You, you know, you're talking about an oppressed group, but there have been, there are several groups that, right. that have been oppressed. Native Americans as well, mm -hmm. you know, um, at one point ha were oppressed. How do you see self-esteem as a major issue? 
Well, if you believe, if you've been believed what you've been taught, let's say if you were a member of a press group and you were taught that you were lazy and illiterate and good for nothing, oftentimes people tend to internalize that, and even worse, they teach it to their children. Because for many years, for example, women were taught by their parents that they couldn't do certain things. Many African Americans were given negative messages as children from their parents who may have eternalized it. And the same is true, as you mentioned earlier, with the Native Americans. But it's key to studying this and knowing this when you face it so that you can handle it in a proper fashion. Exactly. Now, as you know earlier, um, some of the viewers that missed are talking with Ms. Uh, Christine Jackson, the executive mm -hmm. director of the YWCA. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the Martin Luther King celebration. Let's take a twist a little bit okay. about history with the Martin Luther King celebration. We're coming into, as you, we know, um, African American history in February, mm -hmm. but still history itself plays a role. Like Ms. Jackson said, when we celebrate Martin Luther King's uh, cele his birthday, it's not just for African Americans. It's for everybody because he opened up the floodgates for everybody. How did that relate? How does that relate to to history as as it is in our everyday life um, as far as eliminating racism? Can you give me some some feel about history and very much so because see it's not often taught that Dr. King was influenced by the Indian leader Mohandas Gandhi. Because he was open to that, he was able to take what he learned from Gandhi and apply it to the African-American situation. Just, uh, they have, just uh, one of his associates, as a matter of fact, was a Jewish rabbi named uh, Dr. Abraham Heschel. And because he was not a racist person, he was open to Dr. Heschel's advice upon forming his civil rights strategy. So one of the lessons that people other than African-Americans can learn from the experience of Dr. King is to be open to people who are different than you exactly. so that you could learn something from them to enrich your life. Whereas if you were closed-minded, you would miss a whole lot from other people that may be able to teach you something. Exactly. And, um, you uh, told me about your experience going on the road. Um, Operation Understanding is right. one of the things that you do. Tell me a little bit about that. Operation Understanding was a group of Jewish and African-American students that traveled through major areas of the country dealing with ma major issues of Jewish and African American history. We visited Holocaust museums as well as many places in the South where the Civil Rights Movement took place. And it was through that experience that the children began to understand each other's culture and to begin to deal with each other as friends and as human beings rather than just blacks or Jewish people. Exactly. And how did you see with that, how, how did it help those students? What were some of the reactions? from that tour. I'm glad you asked me that. We had an incident in Birmingham where we were in a Chinese restaurant and some jokes about Asians were being told and one of the students got up and told us, remember, told us to remember that we were in Birmingham where four little girls were killed by intolerance and by telling and making those type of jokes we were just passing on intolerance. So I was really impressed that one of them learned and took that to heart to the degree that he was able to get up in face of pro possible opposition from his peers to make a stand against something like that so we all learn from it. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. This show, as I said, this year, we're focusing on assessing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is self-evaluation. And as I try to get, a, get across to the, to the viewers, that it's important that we look within ourselves. That's right. And a lot of the reason I had you come on the show mm -hmm. was because you were a history teacher. Mm -hmm. And what better way to learn than from history? As I teach my students in the class that I teach, history, economics, and your culture. And you must do that and understand each other's cultures and each other's history. And that's why you're here today, because you teach all of this U.S. history and you can share all these things with us. So I wanted to find out from you, what tips would you give some of our parents out there about teaching their children about history? I would encourage parents to be as open as possible to these type of things. I encourage parents to go to the libraries and ask the librarians which books would be available and appropriate for their children so that they could teach the children themselves in case the schools don't teach it to them. Because as Martin Luther King's father once said, you cannot lead where you do not go and you cannot teach what you do not know. All right, all right. If someone needs to get in touch with you, um, Mr. Fordham, how can they call you? They could call me at the College of Charleston's uh, History Department. My office there is 953-7327. Okay.
Okay, I'm there mostly in the afternoons, Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday. And as I asked Ms. Jackson, what would be your one word of inspiration for our viewers? My one word for inspiration, learn. All right. You heard it right here on the signal. Learn so you can understand what's going on around you. That's right. That's right. Mr. Fordham, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Fair Corner. It was very informative, and I hope that you got something out of it as well. Next, uh, we're going to take a break right now, and uh, we'll be right back. With its palm trees and cobblestone streets, Charleston holds an unusual charm and memories of a bygone era in the American South. Millions of tourists from across the world come to experience the southern gentility that the history books portray. But there is a piece of Charleston that speaks to a brutal aspect of American history. Nobody likes to deal with the less flattering sections of their history, and of course here in Charleston people would have rather dealt with the gone with the wind version of history than this aspect. Many Africans would step off of the ships at the port of Charleston to begin a new life of slavery. At first they were sold here outside of the customs house. The problem with that was that you had the Africans there naked and chained and whatnot and so a lot of the a lot of the people in the area complained about that. So city leaders moved the slave market from the customs house to a less visible place here on Chalmers Street. This building which was originally built in 18 1820, and it was again used as a slave mart in 1852. Although Fordham says that some people are under the misconception that the city's popular marketplace was a slave market. One very well-known uh, African-American radio host was going was telling me how when she walked through the slave market, she could feel the pain of her ancestors, and actually she could feel the pain of her imagination. Actually, during colonial times and still today, this market has been used to sell fresh vegetables and baskets, not people. Today, the slave market on Chalmers Street is closed due to a lack of funds. Plans are in the works to reopen the building as a museum, a reminder of a painful time in the American experience as we head into the new millennium. Kelly Crump, TV 13 News. City Council also agreed to give the bodies found under Burke High School a, pop, a proper burial, should I say. Sixty bodies were found on the site where the new Burke High School will be built. The site was an old potter's field where the city's poor were buried for generations. Tonight, Councilman Gilliard made a resolution to properly, properly bury the bodies at the First Baptist Church in Ravenel and to honor the dead with a ceremony. College of Charleston professor Damon Fordham has been researching this area. Potter's Field is extremely significant because, number one, it was not only the site where poor people in Charleston were buried, but it was also one of the few integrated grave sites in Charleston at a time when segregation was the general rule. It was also suggested at the meeting that a memorial be built at the site of the old graveyard to educate the public about the historic site. The controversial golf tunnel project in James Island is back on track. City Council accepted about $720,000 from state transportation officials to pay for the new tunnel at the municipal golf course. Critics were upset that so much taxpayer money was being invested in the project, but supporters pointed out that the course is the busiest in the state and the tunnel is needed to allow golfers to safely cross Maybank Highway. The future of Sunday liquor sales on Daniel Island now rests in the hands of voters. Alco at Burke High School. A memorial service before the bones were moved. That's where News 2's Kurt Hogan has our story. While building the new Burke High School just across the street, archaeologists discovered the remains of 90 people, probably buried as early as the 18th century. Now those bodies are contained here in these boxes. People here say it's about time those bodies are buried with dignity. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The Friends of Burke High School Choir sing out for the unknown souls once buried in an indigent cemetery, lost in history and covered by developers over time. But what has since been uncovered were the unfulfilled wishes of Charleston's mayor in 1925. 
Well, I did some research with the city yearbooks and the city records, and there's no indication that Mayor uh, Thomas Stoney's wishes that the people have, e have had a decent ceremony with uh, flowers and the whole like. There was no evidence that that was ever done until now, when neighbors have come out to sincerely acknowledge them, regardless of their actual identity. They don't know exactly who they are. They're white, black, everything, but we're still all one community. And everyone should come out, and everyone should pay their respects. We needed to do this, to do that for them. We now know that uh, some of the Hunley soldiers were buried uh, near this site. Uh, some of the Union soldiers, uh, poor people included. So it was only fitting to bring a closure, to have a proper burial for these people. Finally, the pastor reminds the congregation that these bones represent our ancestors, who lived in more challenging times, and we honor them best by being our best. Thank God for these bones. But these bones are speaking right now. The only thing they got to do is to stop and listen. Cemetery plots have been donated by the First Baptist Church in Ravenel. That's where these remains are off to in hopes of finding a final resting place in Charleston. Kurt Hogan, News 2. My South Speaks, man. Turn it south. We're going to keep the... observance week now one of the special things about king's legacy is the staying power of his message amanda fitzpatrick is standing by this morning with a special guest who's here to tell us about king's message in the 21st century amanda that's right good morning amy bill and you know the old saying goes if you don't know where you're going unless you know where you're coming from and professor damon fordham who's the african-american studies professor at springfield college you know as people are putting down their coffee and they're heading out today when you think about the message what can they take from what king said in that speech well first of all you have to understand that he made more than just that major speech and did more than just integrate bus counters and the like he also went on to encourage the nation to get away from such things as war and poverty at a time when it was very unpopular to do so. Okay, and he, the message continues. And I have to tell you that, you know, Senator Robert Ford spoke on Monday about King and the state of race relations. Mm -hmm. And this is what he had to say about the dream. 